Hello, this reflection is based on the book of Genesis, chapter 18, verses 1 to 15. Since the death of George Floyd on May 25th, there's been demonstration every day in the United States as well as in every major city around the world. And honestly, I have resisted to address this topic in a sermon because I do not believe the world needs another white middle-aged man trying to explain oppression and racism. The images and the events we can see every day on the news are more convincing than anything I could say. As the crowd is calling for reform, of law enforcement and more racial justice. Many commentators are stating that we live in an historical moment. Our world will never be the same, they say. The promise of a post-racial world is on the verge to become a reality. Eh, I don't know. The human nature being as it is, I am somehow skeptic about this. Similar words have been said in the 1960s civic right movement. They have been repeated in 2008 after the election of Barack Obama as President of the United States of America. And yes, thank God there's been a lot, there's some improvement across the years, but on so many topics. The lives of miserable minority have remained the same. So, after all the commitments and official statement, why would this time be different, we may wonder? Why would the people trust that change and transformation will happen this time? How can they believe? and the promise they have received for so long and remain unkept. This morning's scripture reading came from the book of Genesis, chapter 18, like I said previously. And it feels as we're jumping in the middle of a story. So let me recapitulate the previous parts for those who might, know it, might not know it well. Everything begins in uh, chapter 12. Abraham is a married man running a fairly prosperous family business in the city of Haran. And one day, out of the blue, God shows up in his life and asks him to leave behind his home, his country, in order to go to an unspecified land that God will show him eventually in the future. In exchange, Abraham will become the father of a great nation. His offspring will be as many as the stars in the sky. So Abraham leaves his father's house with his wife, Sarah, and they follow every instruction that God asked them to do. But time goes by, and the couple remains without an heir. Abraham initially believed that his nephew Lot or his servant Eleazar will assure his secession, but God said, no, no. God keep reassuring Abraham and continue to promise that he will have a son. Okay. A little later, Abraham conceived a son with Agar, Sarah's head and maid. God says, no, 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 that's not what I meant. Promised son will come from your wife, Sarah. Okay. And times go on. Times pass. And Sarah and Abraham still have no child of their own, despite the commitment made by God on repeated occasion. So one day, as he's sitting at the entrance of his tent, Abraham sees three men coming in his direction. And immediately he runs to them and invites the traveler to his modest home. 
You see, back then, hospitality was more than a social convention. It was an essential pillar of their society. When people live in a harsh and hostile environment, in in desert-like climate, they ought to look for one another if they want to survive. So the man accepted the invitation. Sarah and Abraham prepared what could be considered a feast. And at the end of the meal, they ask Abraham, where's your wife? He replies, well, she's in the tent. Then one man says, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. Sarah, who happened to be at the tent entrance, began to laugh. But her laughter is not one of joy, happiness, or relief, but one of skepticism. It's like, (laughs) yeah, sure. My husband and I have been trying for years now. And and we're not getting younger. In fact, I may be too old to be pregnant. But you guys never met us before. Come here and tell us that somehow you have a better understanding of human biology than us. And you promise us Something that God has not been able to deliver for years? (laughs) Of course I believe you. (sighs) Many have criticized Sarah's cynical attitude and her apparent lack of faith. She should not have laughed according to them. But can we really blame her? Because the facts in front of her were not reassuring. Sarah and Abraham were getting older and most likely tired of empty promises. The passing years were only a cruel reminder of God's inability to solve their problem despite being, the promise being repeated over and again. So as far as she's concerned, God did not keep God's word. The deal was off. The contract between them was broken. Most of us like the stories when God show up in in great moments. God was telling Noah to build an ark to save his family and animals from the flood. God who protects Moses and the Israelites during the exodus from Egypt. God who raised Jesus from the dead. We enjoy those powerful acts that fill us with awe and, and wonders. We claim that nothing is too wonderful for the Lord. Nothing is impossible for the Almighty One. And the absence of God's deeds in our life can only be explained by our incapacity to see them, or lack of faith, because God always reward those who believe sincerely. We like to say that. We like to believe that. However, for those who are going through hard time, facing oppression on a daily basis, and struggling with undeserved circumstances, It's difficult to accept such reasoning. Because they have done everything right. They followed all the laws, the rules, the regulation. They believe in all the promises they received. And yet their lives are still difficult. So they turn to God and wonder, is it too hard for you to show up here once in a while? Is it too difficult to bring salvation to my family, my people? They begin to doubt. Because there's nothing more hurtful than a promise repeated over and again that has been systematically unkept. They lose hope. They become cynical. 
and their sufferance leads them sometimes to the extreme. Sarah had lost faith in this God who talked all those years, but then nothing was not able to deliver. But one day, a little later in the story, God finally shows up quietly in the life of this woman who suffered greatly. And Sarah's skeptical laugh is transformed into one of joy with the birth of her son Isaac. The promise made so many years ago was finally fulfilled by a God who never forgot her and Abraham. And this story highlights the very character of God. Through God's action, weeping is transformed into joy. Cynicism is replaced by hope. Bitterness is changed into love. Of course, God's promises are not always fulfilled immediately or in the way we would prefer. Nevertheless, God always seems to find a way. And not just for a specific category of believer, for a selected nation, or for one special elderly couple. No. But for the whole of humankind. Our God is creative in the ways God responds to our challenges, affliction, and pain. God is always active in the midst of our lives and never forget us despite our doubts, because God is God. This is simply who God is. This is the nature of God. So can we trust promises that have been repeated over and again? Can we say this time will mark a significant change in the life of those impacted by racism? Can we believe in God? when the facts in front of us seems to show otherwise? I don't know. I guess the choice is ours to follow in Sarah and Abraham's footsteps. The choice is ours to believe that God remains with us regardless of the situation. The choice is ours to take a leap of faith. Amen. Once again, thank you for being there, thank you for watching, and I hope you will have a great week. Bye-bye.